Our next guest is a writer and the editor at The Nation. That is the magazine that we love to cover. Um, he was previously covered the 2016 election as the magazine's editor at large, and for two decades before that, was part of its London bureau, The Nation on Drugs, a fight that we have been fighting forever, the war on drugs. What is the state? What are the ramifications? What? How have Americans been affected? Uh, very excited to have Didi Guttenplan, who has COVID right now. So uh, thank you for joining us. I know that this has been a rough week, but it's you're doing a little bit better, right? I'm doing a lot better and better than I sound. And, <laughs> okay, uh, good. That's most not, important. Not contagious over the internet. So <laughs> One thing I have learned <laughs> during the pandemic is that you can't catch it over the internet. You can't catch it over the internet. A lot of things you can catch over the internet, but not COVID. And also yes, just you can to catch say fascism. it's- it's a pleasure to be after Stephen Donziger, um, who, like you, we have covered, whose struggles we have supported, and it's great to see him out. So yes, just to say yes. That. he's been talk about. I mean, I'm glad that he linked it to the Federalist uh, Society because this is ultimately we have to understand the connections between the the decades long um, goals of the right wing and how it's affecting us today, and that includes. Uh, you know, the, the, I don't even know how to say it, not just the war on drugs, but just every single aspect of what came about, um, whether it's the border, uh, issues of the border or families that have been affected by the war on drugs, um, or just the movement of drugs, uh, across our borders. And of course the imprisonment of folks who've been, who've used drugs or dealt drugs. So, so what is this, this nation on drugs? Um, what, what is your sure. goal with this? Well, a couple of things. First of all, America has been fighting a war on one form or another of intoxicants since Alexander Hamilton, hmm. who started taxing whiskey producers in, in Western Pennsylvania in order to favor corporate whiskey producers. That was called the Whiskey Rebellion. So the government has been intervening in people's choice of intoxicants for a long time. But the reason we decided to do a special issue devoted to drugs is because in a way that conventional war on drugs, or at least against marijuana and psychedelics, seems in some ways to be ending. But what's coming out of it is not a utopia where everybody grows their own, uses their own, turns on their neighbors, has a good time, manages their own risks. What's coming out of it is a co another assertion of corporate power, monopoly power. And it was that intersection of the waning of the overt drug war and the transition to a kind of corporate patent war, corporate power grab, Wall Street power grab. That's where we felt the nation needed to jump in. And also, you know, we can get into this as much or as little as you like. For me, this is, as an aging boomer, something of a personal fight. Why is that? Well, because I used a lot of drugs. I mean, as I, as I, say, in the, <laughs> as I say in the editorial, I mean, yes, I my kids are all grown now, uh, but when they were small, you know, I dreaded them asking, well, what did you do when you were, you know, what did you do in the war on drugs, daddy? Because <laughs> the truthful answer would have been everything pretty much. Uh, you know, as I write in the nation, if you could sniff it, smoke it, snort it, uh, I probably did. And yet, you know, here I am, boringly respectable, uh, you know, the editor of a legacy media publication. Mm -hmm. And part of that is dumb luck. I have friends who died of AIDS because of mm -hmm. infected needles. Uh, I have friends who, you know, became junkies and eventually died of that. Uh, neither of those things happened to me, but they might have. Mm -hmm. And uh, and also a white privilege. Right. Because, you know, as we write in the issue, the war on drugs was never an equal opportunity war. It was always aimed squarely and mainly at black America. And, you know, John Ehrlichman confessed this some 20, 20 years after the fact, but it was always aimed squarely at black America and at the counterculture. Mm -hmm. And okay, you know, maybe I was a participant in the counterculture in my own small way. But, you know, the risks that I was running as someone who was using drugs, even occasionally dealing drugs, I think I'm past the statute of limitations on that. I meant to check, but if not, I'll take my chances. Um, 
you know, those were much smaller than if I were, you know, a black person in urban America at the time under federal, state, and city surveillance, and for whom the drug war was a tool in keeping communities controlled and contained. So you said that at the start that we've we've sort of tr you know transitioned away from um, the war on marijuana and psych psychedelics. Uh, marijuana in particular has been um, such a, a tool of going after black and brown communities. Does this mean that the right wing is not as interested in going after, at least from criminal justice perspective, black and brown communities? I mean, I live in New York and this is crime. This is the talk of the town right now because of our of our, our mayor um, and in a lot of cities around the country, you know, the right wing is pushing the crime narrative. But if marijuana is decriminalized in New York, like, w what's the view? No, I'll go on something else. But so I live in New York, too. And in my part of Brooklyn, I don't, I don't know whether you've noticed this, Numiki, but in my part of Brooklyn, there are all of these medical clinics that were set up, for example, on Court Street in Brooklyn Heights. Mm -hmm. And now they're, even though New York has not yet regulated the sale of marijuana. It's legalized or decriminalized, but not yet legal. Right. They've all dropped the pretense of being medical dispensaries, and they're ready for retail customers. Now, I don't know whether they're serving retail customers yet, but they are ready. So I don't think, you know, I don't think that the Adams administration or any other administration is going to be able to roll that back. But does that mean that control of black and brown bodies has stopped being a government preoccupation. I wish it were so, but I don't think so. And that's why I make the point in my editorial and uh, Tavian Crossland, who's a young, a young man who writes in this issue of his experiences as being a person who dealt weed and saw his fellow dealers of color sidelined by the wave of legalization. You know, these are people who have decades of experience. Right. And yet, you know, the all the legal entrepreneurs and legal outlets we see coming up are Wall Street funded and overwhelmingly white. So, you know, we, we feel that reparations ought to be an essential first part of any legalization. Um, do you see that happening anywhere in the country right now in, in, in terms of states that have legalized where there's a real fight or a movement that's making ways um, for reparations? Yes, there are states that have have called for equitable, you know, equitable funding, equitable distribution, equitable licensing. I don't, I can't name them off the top of my head, but New York State is supposedly among them in terms of the legislation, but we haven't seen it yet. Right. And, you know, the devil's going to be in the details. Certainly New York has the chance to really as it did during the New Deal days under Franklin Roosevelt, to be a real pioneer for justice here, to really say to people and communities, particularly who've been bearing the brunt of the drug war, we're not just going to get off your necks. We're going to help you repair the damage we did. Mm -hmm. That's so what, what, other, means. what other aspects of society right now, um, you know, are, are affected or have been affected by these drug wars that if there is, you know, more and more decriminalization um, across the country, it, it could affect how those communities have been um, essentially, you know, uh, persecuted. Well, I mean, there's, there's a lot. I mean, the drug war was a real catch-all for a whole bunch of bad things. You know, in addition to policing black and brown bodies, it also committed the U.S. to allying with the most repressive regimes in Latin America. You know, it served as cover for intervention in, in countries that were daring to consider that maybe they would have a more redistributionist approach, you know, to economic justice. Right. Um, so there are lots of repercussions and lots of good things that come out, could come out of stopping the drug war. But, you know, there's also a warning, and I, I sound that note in my editorial when I talk about Aldous Huxley and Soma, which is to say that, you know, in... In Huxley's novel, Brave New World, one of the things that enabled the kind of fascist takeover of the country, whatever country he was writing about, whatever fictional country, uh, was that the populace was so busy, you know, stoned on Soma that they were, they were too blissed out to resist. Right. You know, so I think as we see, 
for example, ketamine parlors springing up all across the South, which is one of the things that Zoe Cormier, who wrote our cover piece on Psychedelics Inc., uh, and Aida Chavez, who wrote our piece, you know, on on uh, on mushrooms and psychedelics, uh, both of them talked about this wave of kind of privatization in which people are offered low cost ketamine treatment, but really what it means is just access to the drugs, not therapy, not a safe environment, not anything that's gonna do you do anything except turn you into a reliable long-term consumer or what we used to call an addict. So, you know, I think that's one of the things we have to be careful about. And it's one of the things that we hope and we would like to help push for, which is the leveraging of the legalization of particularly psychedelics, which have a long history of use both in black and brown communities, in indigenous communities, not just north of the border, but south of the border, but also in the counterculture to come up with alternative models of redistribution, of distribution, of, of production, of ownership. You know, there's a, there's a lot of space here for potential innovation politically. That doesn't mean like new shiny corporate logos. It means new ways of relating to each other, new ways of accessing these experiences that don't involve, you know, sh signing up to shiny corporate brands. A hundred percent. And, you know, in, in, a, in a use with caution or like a toolkit, how, how to use them responsibly? Because, I mean, I'll speak from my own experience. Um, yeah, I mean, I've I've mushrooms, for instance. Uh, taking mushrooms with a guide is a very different experience than taking mushrooms out with your friends, <laughs> boating, for instance. <laughs> I'll just leave that one there. <laughs> Didn't end well. I'll just say that. <laughs> was was fun until we couldn't dock the boat. <laughs> Um, no, but I mean, for real, it can be very dangerous. You know, people have had bad trips, but there, there is a, there's a magical experience in when you're working with somebody and it can be profound and transformative and fun too. But, um, you know, it's, you know, this is something that people have actually been talking about for a long time, you know, before he became his own wellness guru, uh, Andrew Weil, mm -hmm. uh, was yeah. advocating yeah. for a different kind of drug education, which would be about safe use you know, teaching kids what's safe and what isn't, uh, you know, the differentiating between drugs that are designed to get you addicted as quickly as possible uh, and those that are that are not between, you know, uh, natural organically grown products that where you're the, produ the production chain, where you have a relationship with the producer or the grower, exactly. where you know what you're getting. Um, and where there are members of your community. So they have a stake in making sure you have a safe experience. Right. Right. You know, th those are all things that we could be teaching kids in school in the same way that we teach about, you know, how to safely drive a car. And also, you know, it's it's not in the corporation's interest to do that, um, which is very dangerous. I think that if, if, they're, if, if corporate interests are getting involved in the drug industry, especially psychedelics, um, it can absolutely affect somebody's life. I mean, it's not uh, smoking a little weed here and there is one thing, but you no, know, these are strong drugs. These, these can, can be life changing experiences in bad ways for people, particularly if they don't know what they're doing, they don't know what they're getting, and there isn't somebody responsible on hand to help if they need it. Absolutely. Right. I mean, you know, the, the nation, we did not say turn on, tune in, drop out on the cover of this issue. Um, you know, we talked about the transition from head, head shop to hedge fund as something that we should all be worried about. A hundred percent. Really fascinating. I, I know you're sick, so I don't want uh, <laughs> to exhaust you right now. And so you have a smooth recovery, but um, would love to have you back on. We can talk more about this and, and I'm sure we'll have some of uh, the writers um, at The Nation discuss their individual pieces because there's so much here, but folks definitely go check it out. Uh, I think Probably most of our audience cares about this issue, if I'm going to be honest. <laughs> well, it's good. You know, you can, you can check out the issue and other coverage of this issue on www.thenation.com. And, you know, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Take Thank care. you so much, Don. Take care and feel better. Thank you. If you're not already a patron, make sure to join us at patreon.com slash the Nomi Show. You can get a mug, a sticker, a bag, uh, lots of stuff coming our way. 